done with no finish on it, it's just made out of poplar. Just to kind of show you what the finished product is going to look like. Can you mute your mic, Gerald? Or are you muted? I'm getting echo. I don't know if anybody else is. I'm still. Now you don't hear me. Not bad. Am I on? Anybody? You guys can hear me. Okay. Because the echo went away. But I don't hear. Okay. I I don't hear anything, so I assume it's still working. <laughs> Okay. Uh, this particular kit I got uh, from Timber Bits, which is in Australia. Uh, searched around several places, Woodcraft and Rockler and them to look for these, and it was actually cheaper to get them from uh, Timber Bits in Australia and pay the shipping from there than it was to get them here. They worked out to just under ten dollars a kit, and uh, the shipping though it did take. Uh, it was about four weeks, so it took almost a month, so it wasn't fast. But I think even right now, the U.S. mail is pretty slow, too. And here's what the kit looks like when you get it. It comes in this package, and what it is is you have a, a cap for each end. The brass tube goes through the center of the egg. And then you have some other pieces in there. I'll show you when I assemble it. And there's also inside the tube, it comes already in there. So be careful when you take that tube out. There's three small mirrors in there, which is what creates the effect of the kaleidoscope. So what you're gonna do, it says the block size should be a two by two by two and a quarter. Now, what I found is I tend to cut them a little short when I uh, turn them, show you off the ends a little bit. So I started making them a little bit longer because both of these that I've done ended up being too short. You can't have the two and a quarter is critical. And I'll show you that later. But basically what happens is when you screw this together, on that brass tube, these clamp the wood in between. If this is too short, that tube will move back and forth in there. So I started turning, cutting these about two and five sixteenths, just slightly longer. The first thing we're going to do is drill the hole through the center for the tube. And with my jaws, the Nova Chuck here, and the standard jaws, waiting for Gerald to change the, the view here. It's a new world every day. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Mine will fit right in there as a square. What's that? <laughs> but anyway, this will fit right in there. If you won't fit in your jaws, you can turn between centers and put a tenon on here and start it out. But mine works just perfect right there. So I can put that in there and tighten it down. The whole size through the center is 13 sixteenths. And most of us do not have a 13 sixteenths bit. Uh, I was fortunate, my buddy Tim ordered a couple of these and shared one of them with me. Uh, the closest you can get for a standard size Forstner bit is uh, three quarters. And that's what I started when I first started doing these. And I don't know if you can see that or not, get it the right way here. See the little step in there. So I drilled through with a three quarter inch bit, then took a skew and just kind of went in there, done slightly enlarged that. I mean, you're only talking a sixteenth of an inch between three quarters and 13 sixteenths. So you don't want to take much off. So that's a, an alternative to do that if you don't have the 13 sixteenths bit. So what I'm going to do is turn the lathe on, I'm going to drill all the way through. Get my shield on. So, if you guys are familiar with drilling, back up here a minute. The easiest way to start this, and I learned this from Gerald here recently, is you want to get a starting point in the center of your wood here. 
So I'm just going to come in here and just put a little dimple in the center. to give the point of the portion a bit of place to start. Bring this up. When you use your Forstner bits, make sure you hold the chuck in here. That way if it comes loose or it tries to come out when you back out, you've got a grip on it. That's just a safety feature there. You also want to make sure when you drill that you keep the, the tip cleared. So you go in a ways and then you can back out if it starts clogging up. You see this one's actually smoking a little bit. It's some pretty hard wood. This is a, a type of rose wood. Back How fast do you drill? 500 RPM. So I think drill, we have, we all have a tendency to drill too fast. Is your smoke in there? Just a little bit, yeah. On my Forstner bits, of course, I'm usually using a larger one. I usually do from three to four hundred. Yeah, this one's fairly small, so. And the, the other woods I've done have not smoked. Just, just this one's slightly harder. So we'll see how it turns when I get to that point. You also notice when I back it out, I'm just loosening it and, and pulling it out. And the reason I'm doing that, if you try to back it out uh, with the tail stock, sometimes they'll really squeal, make a lot of noise. And if you just pull them out like that, just pull the tail stock back, back, it may squeal, but not as long. Just keep working my way through. From what I could see when I ordered the kits, all of these kits are the same, uh, whether they're from Woodcraft or this timber bits. I think there's really only so many companies that make these things, just like pin kits. So they each name them a little bit different, but they're all basically the same. And I'm just gone through there. So that's all the way through. Take my drill bit out of the tailstock here. I do not have a self ejecting tailstock on the Nova lathe, so I have to, to knock it out. All right. So we went all the way through. Nice clean hole. Grab the one in here just to show you. Nice fit in there. So that's the first step. And give me a second while I take my chuck off here and change over. Uh, they call for uh, a pin mandrel to turn the egg. Now, if you guys don't have that, you can probably figure other ways to do it. I happen to have turned quite a few pins over the years, so I have a mandrel. And they call for uh, a special bushings that they sell, just like they do for all the individual pin kits. I did not want to buy those, because I don't turn that many of these. And so I didn't want to spend the extra money. So what I have done is I made a couple of just tapered bushings, just to actually do those kind of quick so they're not even the same size. I took a seven millimeter brass tube from a seven millimeter pin kit, drilled it, glued it in with epoxy 
into the end. And then uh, you just had these short pieces, cut them off, cut the tube off, smoothed it up, and then just turned the taper on it. So that I can put this on. I've got a, just a couple of spacers there and a washer just to help hold it tight. Slide this one on. The other end. And then a couple more spacers just to give me room for the tools and for my tool rest. And I happen to have a, they call it a mandrel, or a, I think it's a man, mandrel saver, I believe is what they call this. It's basically life center with a hole. And this is on a bearing. So that goes in the tailstock. Gerald, can you back it out just a little bit? And uh, there we go. And then I can just tighten that down in there. Bill, where'd you get that piece uh, for your tailstock? This, uh, I don't remember if it was uh, Penn State Industries, uh, Woodcraft, or who. There's a lot of companies that sell them. Like I said, I believe it's called the Mandrel Saver. And I just realized I put the, the washer on the wrong side there. I think they're about 20 bucks. Yeah. This one I've had for quite a while, and you probably hear it when I start turning. I think the bearing is starting to, to go out, and it's basically a bearing in the end and then the outer shell. Uh, but I've turned a lot of pins, and a lot of the pins I wet sand with micro mesh, so probably has had water get in there over the years. So one of the, the hardest, I'm sorry, somebody have a question? I just said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I don't know how many of you guys have turned eggs, but eggs are not easy to turn to get the shape correct. Uh, these two that I showed you earlier, I just kind of eyeballed, and you can see the shape is not real, real nice. This one's probably a little bit better than this one. And then this one is actually probably the best of the three. It's a little hard to see. The light's a little bright, I think. But the light is there for a reason. What I've got, Gerald, if you can show uh, straight on to me there for a second, is I put a uh, just a magnetic light here on top of the lathe shining straight down and this was something i saw in a video this week is to make just a little platform to go up under here and i just threw together or <laughs> there we go uh just some scrap one by six uh actually it may have been one by eight uh wood pine wood that i had and made a little base here and you guys have probably done this for other stuff, but this will go down in the ways. And I've got a, actually, I think it's a toilet uh, mount bolt set in a, in a, up underneath there. And that way I can just kind of clamp this in here. I'm just going to tighten that set screw down. And what I'm going to do is I have a pattern I downloaded off the internet of an egg that helps me kind of make the shape. And you know, the basis of this is you're using the shadows cast by the light from being overhead to turn your egg. So here is a pattern. And there just happens to be three of them on there. I just cut it out. Uh, and then what I do is I tape it down. Now I prefer to do the large end of the egg towards the headstock and the, the smaller end towards the tailstock. It really does not matter. It's just whatever you prefer. So I'm just going to take and I kind of centered this pattern on there. Get my light back over, moved it a little bit evidently. Try to get it kind of centered in the end and side to side and when i start turning this it will give me a shadow line for the shape and 
I can I just use this blue tape that way I can take it off and readjust this a little bit if I need to. I can also move the platform a little bit. But this will give me, you can see the ends here where the shadow lines are and the mandrels or the, the bushings rather where they go in, kind of give you a guideline of where to, to cut. So I'm going to set this up and just start rounding my egg here. How did you arrive at the template? It's just an egg template. I just I just Googled it online, uh, egg template, and uh, there's a lot of them. Just go to images and Google, and you can just you know pick from them. Originally, I thought this one was going to be a little bit big, so I had reduced the size. But when I did, I ended up being a little bit small again. So I, this is just the size it was online. It was three, or actually nine eggs on a sheet. So three rows of three. I just cut this strip out and put it on there. So I'm going to now uh, round this over. Start with my roughing gouge. You can hear that bearing a little bit probably. I don't know how well you can hear it. Let's see, I'm a little bit high. No, oh, I'm sorry, I have one other thing I forgot. I don't have my smock on. I got that wire for my microphone hanging out. So I'm gonna put that up under my smock here just so we don't. Make sure it doesn't get caught in that lathe. Try to do this as safely as we can. I don't need to broadcast these. Get all tangled up in this. That would not be a good thing. So here we go. Start over here. I'm about 1200 RPM here. Small piece of wood. Not going to fly out. Probably getting pretty close to round there. Do it well, clumping there, hold it on there until there's still a flat spot. Still a little bit, but by the time I get this rounded, we'll be pretty good. I also need to move my pattern a little bit. Now that I got it rounded, I'm a little bit off center. So I'm just going to untape this and move it over slightly. That is about the right diameter right there. Diameter on this is not critical for uh, assembly. Again, the thing you have to watch is the length. So now I'll take a spindle gouge and just start rounding that over. And you can see now, like I said, the shadow gives you a pretty good guideline of where we want to go. Uh, hang on, guy. Second guy. Sorry about that. My lathe has had a little issue lately of shutting down. I think there's a sensor inside that I've got to replace. There we go. Got to kind of keep sawdust off the pattern is the hardest part here. Actually, when I'm normally turning, I have a vacuum going, so it will suck a lot of that away.
Either two, you can follow the shadow on either side. If you can see a cross, because it's obviously going to be the same on both sides. You can see. The only end right there on the end is why I usually tend to and get a little short on these. What's that? Sound is coming through muffled. Okay. Let me stop this a second. Move my microphone. See if that helps. Is that better? Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay. See, I still have a little bit of a flat spot there, so I am going to have to take this down to a little bit smaller diameter. <clears throat> Just slightly more there. That actually pretty close. You see I've got a couple of spots there where it's not quite right, but it's pretty close. I can bring this down here, get rid of that flat spot. And because I'm not that good with my tool control, I cheat. I use a negative rake scraper a lot and then sandpaper. Bring this up just slightly. Like I said, any of you guys have tried turning edge before, they are a difficult shape to do. It looks so simple, but when you really get to it and you start looking at your finished products there, they can be a little bit off one way or the other and just don't look natural. See how that works. Oh, hey, cool. Bill, after we're done, I want to get Gary Joyce to tell us about his uh, adventure turning eggs at a, uh, simple, at a uh, meeting he went to with Sammy. Okay. Yeah, a little bit of gouge there. I was a little bit uh, aggressive with my gouge. Uh, bring this down a little bit more.
see how that looks. And I got rid of most of it. Just one little spot there uh, from the original exterior. But that'll sand out. That though still needs to come down somewhere. I did uh, really kind of got aggressive with that there. It's also because your ends of this egg are off. It really kind of uh, messes up your perception because you're not rounded on the ends. You're flat down here and here. So looking at the, uh, the overall shape, it doesn't look quite right. But once you get the ends on, it will uh, improve the, the look, make it look a little better. See if I got rid of that. Yeah, let's fill this a little bit. You're just going to do it one more time here. In the end here, I don't know how well you can see it. Probably not very well. There's a little bit of a flat there that's going to show just slightly when we assemble it. So I'm going to take that down just a hair more. Right up next to my bushing. I'm going to bring it around. take this off now and just do a little bit of sanding. One nice thing about these is when you uh, assemble them, you can put them together and take them apart fairly easily because everything screws together. So you can unscrew them if you need to do a little more sanding, a little more finish work or whatever later on. I'm not going to do too much in here because I don't have my vacuum going and I don't have a dust mask on, so I don't want to sand too much. This is just a little bit of 150. A lot of times, like on pins and stuff, when you're doing spindles, you take and uh, turn it by hand, go with the grain to get rid of some of your scratch marks. I think we should take uh, for the president's challenge when we get back uh, to do an egg. What do you think about that? That's fine. That works for me. I've had more practice recently. <laughs> or am I am I excluded this time? Let me pray about it. <laughs> How long does it take to get the kits? Uh, like about a month if you get them from the Timber Bits. And it's timberbits.com is their address and the smock that I'm wearing also came from them. That's how I, and Gerald actually ordered one of these smocks from them. Uh, I think it was last year, actually maybe a year before now. And I liked it. I the smock I had, everything when you would turn would stick to it. Something with that fabric was like Velcro with the wood chips and it was just miserable trying to get it off. And then, so when Gerald got this and showed it to us, uh, everything just falls off of it. And I didn't realize he changed views there, but I get the right way here, the timber bits. And then I just put the uh, 
club patch on. Right, the other way here. <laughs> I can't figure out which. Oh, there it is. No wonder I'm going the wrong way here. So, does it have pockets it on the back field? It does not. It has uh, sleeve pockets on each side. Nothing in the back. I take that back. Oh, no, 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 nothing in the back. Uh, but it was also about twenty-five dollars. When you guys, if you go to timberbits.com, all of the prices on there are in Australian dollars, not U.S. dollars. When you pay, it converts. And it's actually, if it says 25, it's really only about 21 or 22 because of the exchange rate, which, you know, changes all the time. So, like these kits, I think were 12. You know, let me see. Does not say on there. I think they were marked on the Timberbit side about Twelve dollars each, twelve or twelve fifty. But with the exchange rate and everything, and then the shipping, splitting it out by the number of kits I ordered, like I said, they came out to just under ten dollars each. And I think I ordered uh, fourteen. I think is what it was, three six. Yeah, fourteen. Because I shared those with uh, Tim and Gerald and Herman. So that's how we split it out, and that way we got to share on the shipping costs. So I'm just going to do this a little bit more, and then we'll take it off. And uh, somebody, Tim, or somebody can talk for a minute while we get the cameras reset over to my workbench so you can see the assembly. Tim, if you're going to do this as a challenge, you might want to wait a month or two so that people can get these kits. Well, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about doing the kaleidoscope, although that's a good idea. I was just thinking about uh, egg in general because he's right. That, uh, and I've turned a lot of eggs, but none of them, I say none, several, you know, turned out pretty good. Uh, but sitting with, uh, under class with Betty Sh Scarpino, she turns a lot of eggs. Now, the thing about an egg, is the widest point of that egg actually is the center of the egg, believe it or not. And then you, you know, you adjust from the ends. Um, but what Phil has done is an excellent idea using the shadow cast, I guess you call it. Um, but we could do an egg, you know, set certain parameters. Uh, you could carve it, paint it, burn it, whatever, you know. I think that'd be a, a good challenge for everybody. It's just something easy to do. I'm just taking this down to 600 grit here, and uh, you can finish these several different ways. Uh, the beetle system is what I've done on a couple, which is pretty good. You do have to remember, though, that these are handled a, a lot, so uh, you may want a more durable finish than the beetle system, because like Gerald pointed out in our last call, uh, that's really just polishing. But it really doesn't do too bad. I mean, a lot of hand uh, touching on that and everything will uh, will keep it pretty shiny. You can also, I think, I may be wrong. Somebody can correct me if I am. I think this is called French polishing. You just take a handful of sawdust, take a pretty high speed. What is it? Burnishing. I'm at 2,000 RPM, and just kind of hold it on there with some pressure. You can see the shine pop up. And for those of you who don't know, he actually just basically that's the same thing as rubbing your tool on it, but it's much softer than when you rub your when you rub your bevel, you can actually burnish the wood. It makes a dark spot. Well, that's what he just did, but he did it with wood shavings, and it's much gentler. And some people use that as just the finish and just put wax on it. You can go from there also, and I'll just do this real quick. Triple E, if you guys haven't used this, it works out pretty well, too. Again, it's just a polish. It's not a hard finish. Take, It's not inexpensive, but it does last. I've had this for several years, and it doesn't take much each time. A little bit on your on a clean rag. This is just a piece of old t-shirt. You can see how it's darkening it up. It's 
So you wipe this on without the lathe going. Get a good coat on there. And then with that same section you just had, start rubbing and see that shine pop out. Go back and forth. Again, I'm still at the same RPM here. It is a friction polish. And then take a clean section of the rag. If you guys are using cloth, make sure you do not wrap that around your hand. If that gets wrapped around that lathe and jerks out, it will jerk your hand into it. So I am not at any time wrapping that around my fingers or anywhere around my hand. Phil, so if it does, yes. My uh, Triple E has gotten hard. Is there a solvent that will soften that up? Uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, I know that in the winter it gets a lot harder as it's cold. You can see how that shined up there. Gary, most of these uh, buff products like this are contain wax, and you can try alcohol. You can also try zapping it a little bit in the microwave before you use it. I'm not sure if the microwave will work or not, and it depends on what kind of package you've got. You can take a little bit out and put it on a saucer or something. But uh, most of them have wax, so alcohol will dissolve wa uh, wax, so that should help. Okay, thanks a lot. And this is uh, some stuff I think Gerald showed last week too, Renaissance wax, which does not leave fingerprints and everything, so you can put this over the top. I just leave this rag in there. Actually, didn't get on the camera. There we go. But I, I, and I'm not sure if this is a proper way or not, but I kind of use it like the friction polish. I just wipe some on. And this wax, again, you'll notice uh, this I bought probably five or six years ago. And Jared, uh, Phil, uh, the, 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 I use a lot of the Renaissance. Uh, the best result will be to put it on just like you did and give it just, uh, just a little bit to let it kind of haze over, uh, uh -huh. and then you polish that off, and then that, that gives a wonderful shine. Okay, with this can, and you can see my fingers, that's how full it is, it's still way up there. It's maybe there, it was at the time I bought it $27. So, again, it's expensive. But it has lasted, like I said, five or six years. I don't use it all the time, but I do use it on stuff like this, and it just seems to last. So let's see what didn't have a clean, completely clean rag over here. But this will work. I'm just rubbing that lightly. You can see that shine pop out. You can see that reflection of the light in there. Gerald's trying to talk. <laughs> What's going on is I've got two screens up and the cursor has to be on the right screen in order for it to work. Uh, but I thought if you're doing eggs, they're not getting handled very much. So a, a polish like this would be perfect. You don't have to worry about, and with the Renaissance, you don't have to worry about fingerprints for occasional handling. So right. this is a real good way to finish this kind of stuff. Except the kaleidoscope is made to be handled, but if it's, yeah, it's just a, a, as my mom used to call them, dust collector that sits on the shelf. <laughs> that works great. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take this off now. These bushings end up, because the way I made them, get in there, jammed in there pretty good, but they're really fairly easy to remove. If you just slide this out, and just cock it a little bit, it just pops it right off. Actually, I don't think I could see that, Gerald. It's not in the screen, is it? Yes, it's a good shot. Oh, you could see it, okay. All right, I couldn't see if you could see how I was twisting the egg at the end, there we go. So they get jammed in there and you can't really pull them out. 
So all I do is just put it on the very end of the mandrel and just twist it and it comes right off. So there is the finished egg. Blow a little dust out. Up. <laughs> Down. He, he's just messing with me now. <laughs> all right. So if you give us just a minute, anybody has any questions or comments or wants to talk about something, we're going to turn a couple of the cameras around for a minute here so that I can show you how to assemble this. Okay, I'm going to spotlight uh, Gary Joyce, and he's going to tell us about a class he went to with Sammy, and they turned a whole bunch of eggs, and he's going to tell you that an egg ain't an egg. <laughs> Gary there? There he is. I hadn't turned eggs and gosh, when I first started and back in 07, I uh, went to a class and we had to turn eggs, but I had never turned any since and had forgot about that class. Well, we had to turn eggs. And so I didn't what, what remember saw? how, so we just, I just started turning and, and I was looking at everybody else and see how they were doing it. And, and, um, he came up by me and he looked at me and he looked down at my egg and he he said, uh, Gary, your, your your egg is too tall." And I said, "Out of proportion." And I said, "Well, in in North Louisiana, where I come from, said all our chickens come from Texas." And he just looked at me <laughs> like. What planet did he come from? <laughs> and he walked off a little way, and then it finally dawned on him. You know, everything's tall in Texas. <laughs> but I did learn how to to turn eggs, and so I've turned all mine are all solid. But I don't know if you can see that. I decorate them up, and I notch them up, and I do. Can y'all see that? Nice. Yeah. And so just put, I just put different designs on them. Uh, I've got these stick and burns that they, you know, they showed us at the meeting one time. And, uh, and, and I put different patterns on it. I'm not an artist. I can't draw. So I have to use something. And then you can order these little caps and glue them on and okay. then you can put it on the stand that i got stands and it holds it it up it at a show or something you need more than just bowls to get people's attention to come see what you got and so if you have a lot of things that are different looking they'll come over i burn gourds and paint gourds and hang gourds on little stands and all to get it's a uh, kind of a uh Hmm, what is that? Let me go see what that is. And maybe you can sell some and maybe it'll sell a bowl. I don't know. You never know about people, but it's just an eye catcher. I majored in marketing, so I, I got, you know, <laughs> bring out, bring as much to the table as you can. When you got just one thing, it, it uh, they'll just walk by you. So, but we had fun, and, and I learned to turn eggs and, and other things. He's a really good instructor. He's uh, he's kept in touch with me. He'll, every once in a while, I'll get an email from him. And so he's a, he's a really talented guy. And a very Who was that, Gary? Jacques Versary. Okay. Sorry, when you first started, we couldn't hear you. Oh, Jacques, okay. I'm Jacques sorry. Jacques Versary. Versary. Yeah, Jacques it's, he's French, so it's Jacques Versary. Uh, he's from Maine. <laughs> he was a submariner and all sorts of stuff, but he's a just excellent artist in wood burning and turning and all. Yeah. So, he, but and a very good instructor, and he he ragged me for the rest of the the week. <laughs> Gary, right, you guys huh? made a good laugh. Gary, oh, Gary, he'll keep you in stitches the whole time. Jacques, wow. Ves Jacques Vessery is the one that does surfaces that don't, you know, yeah. they'll do a, a, 
a shell, like a seashell, only you will put this, a snake skin on it, you know. And it, it's just oh, he does all sorts, of, uh, you know, open, wide open stuff that you, you know, he turns and then he turns open spaces in it and all this. Yeah. He, he's, and he's a really nice guy. He's, like I said, every once in a while I get an email from him asking me how I'm doing. Was it great? A, I bought a handle from him, uh, uh, and then some uh, tips and all. Gary? Vesri tells a story about, you know, he tries all these different textures on the outsides of his forms, and one time he turned, what he wanted to do is make a uh, tree branch, you know, kind of a something that'd sit on the table and look like a tree. and he. He did a he did it and he but he did such a good job when he gave it to you know he's he's in a lot of galleries well he's oh yeah gallery and they sent it back and said you know I, we can just go out in the forest and get this he's <laughs> <laughs> that okay. good all right I'm ready whenever you guys are okay I do have one question okay. Um, oh, actually, a story that Gary is reminding me of back, oh gosh, 25 years ago, I was in Provo for a uh, symposium that Dale Nish used to do out of the craft yeah. center, and uh, they would have us do eggs, and uh, it was a competition. You had a certain amount of time, and everybody in, at the workshop would do this, and Richard Rifon was there and looked at my egg and he immediately named me the wood butcher, which I definitely deserved at the time. But I am curious, does anybody, uh, Richard actually um, told me to contact him if ever I could go to Australia and in, an, in the next five, six years, I'd like to go to Australia. Does anybody have Richard Rafon's um, email or any way of contacting him? He's probably in the AAW directory. That's, thank you. That's, that's why this is a great resource. Thank you. That okay. is probably the nicest guy in wood turning, Richard Raffin. Yeah, he was really nice. He, he certainly was laughing at me though. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you guys a short story about Richard. Uh, a lot of you guys know, and, and John has done it also. I was very fortunate in 2011, went on a wood turning cruise in Norway. And Richard was one of the demonstrators on the cruise. And what the cruise was, you went from port to port. There were, I think, 14 different ports that we went through uh, during that time. And when we go into ports, the guy that set up the cruise would open up the ship and he basically had a store set up in there. He lived in southern uh, Norway, and this was a way to take his merchandise up through the north. And these demonstrators would demonstrate on the way, you know, when we're in port. Between ports, we could turn with some of these people. And we had Jimmy Clues and Richard, uh, trying to remember several other big names that I don't recall off the top of my head. But when we first got on board and we're getting ready to set sail, sail, Richard was down in where they had the lay set up and he was trying to get everything set up for his demos. And I was down there watching him and he had taken, he was trying to get a hose set up for the dust collection system. And he had taken a string and tied it around the hose and tied it around the lathe, turned it on to check it out. And somehow that string got caught up in the lathe as it turned <laughs> off, sucked that hose right up into it. And, you know, I just looked at him. He was shaking his head. And he was trying to find a stop and everything. And he finally got stopped and just kind of looking at it. And I thought, well, you know, we're all human. <laughs> so we can all make mistakes. So. It was interesting. That, that kind of brought him down to where, okay, he is, you know, he's a great turner. He, he's way up there, but he is still human. So, <laughs> all right. Anyway, so here's the layout. Uh, not sure if Gerald can get a view. There we go. Okay, great. So this is the egg we just turned. This is a kit taken out of the bag. And they all, these individual pieces come in these little bags, which are kind of a pain to open. Uh, this is the, the tube that'll go between, and I'll slide that a little bit. There you can see the mirrors sticking out slightly. 
So like I said, when you pick this up, if you turn it up, they will fall, fall out. But that's what forms your uh, kaleidoscope effect when you get it in there. So the first thing you want to do is you have two different pieces. The thicker one, the wider one there in my right hand, is the section where the, I'm not sure what you'd call those, the sparklies that make the kaleidoscope go. And this is a lens that you look through. So you can see there's a, the large hole, which would be the light collector, where the light will come in, and then the eye hole you look through. So the first thing you do to start with is you have to take, you lay it upside down, and I have, uh, when you, the instructions from Timber Bits are pretty good. Uh, you do have to download them. They don't come with a kit, but you can just, you can go on their, on their website anytime and just download these. It comes out in the PDF. So the first page is an actual turning of the egg that we went through. And it kind of gives you a little bit of the design here, shows you how it should look. And then this is the assembly instructions. And it shows the uh, exploded view of, of the assembly. So the first thing you do is these little lenses here, there's three lenses, it's a little bit hard to see on here. Two of them are in plastic, protected. And then the third one is actually uh, convex on one side. And I know you can't see that, but it is convex and it's flat. So it's a little bit of a magnification that you look through. So you take the convex side, lay it down in here, and then you have this little C-clamp or C-ring, uh, snap ring that goes in there. What I found is that these just drop in there. It doesn't stay. So what I do is I just take and bend it out slightly so it has a little bit of spring action. I fought with some of these to get them in. So drop it down in there, and they tell you to use a pencil eraser to hold it and then something else that's blunt. So I just I'm try this day. I've been doing a little bit different, but I've got the eraser and just a piece of dowel. So reach down in there, hold it with one side, and then push this in. You don't want anything sharp because it's gonna scratch that lens when, when you slip, not if, but I've ever one of them I slip a little bit trying to get that thing to lock in. But I, like I said, if I don't expand that out, then it just falls back out when I'm assembling this, like just like that. So it's a little, this is probably the hardest part of the assembly is trying to get this little ring down in there and locked in. And I'm going to fight with this one. It keeps popping out. There we go. Almost. I can see it's a little bit up still. All right. So that got that locked in there. So that's done. So you can set that aside. It really is a quick assembly on these. Then you have the two lenses that are in between, sandwiched between pieces of plastic. And they go on the other end. And there's no difference between the two, so it doesn't matter. And when you read the instructions, it talks to this old plastic ring, it talks about a cardboard ring, so it must be some old instructions. That's actually plastic now. But this plastic splits apart. Hopefully I can find it and split it. Somewhere. <laughs> Bite it. Yeah. It's 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 just stuck on there. It's not sealed, so it's just the friction of the plastic that holds it together. And I try not to touch this too much because fingerprints, whatever you're, this is what you're looking through, and also trying not to get much dust. That's why I put the paper towel down here. So you just drop one of those in there, and these just drop in. There's nothing that at this point that holds them in there. The assembly will hold them in there later. And then this little plastic ring drops in. And again, it just drops in. And then they tell you to drop your crystals, or again, I don't know what to call these, into there. And you don't want to put them all in. If you get too many in when you rotate it to get the kaleidoscope effect, they will not rotate, they can jam. And I don't know how well you can see that. 
there are different shapes, different colors in there. There are some that are pretty tiny, uh, but different colors. Like I have kind of selected some of the colors and some of the others I've done. You know, I did some for my granddaughter, so I tried to get more of the pink ones, uh, but really does not matter much. So you just dump these in, and if you get too many in, you can just dump them back out, which I've probably got a couple too many in. So it says to fill it about halfway on that plastic. It's a little hard to tell when you're halfway, but I've not had any when I've done that have not been able to uh, slide around in there when you rotate it. Then you take the second lens and drop that in on top. And that's what keeps those crystals in there are these two lenses that they're sandwiched between. It's plastic sticking to me here. I can't get rid of it. <laughs> There we go. But you can see as I rotate this, they will tumble in there. So the other thing you have to do is take a Sharpie and on the ends of one end of the mirrors, it doesn't matter which end, just one end, you slide them out slightly and then you just blacken that edge so that when you're looking through the end, you're not seeing the raw edge. It just helps with the effect a little bit. And again, all this is in the instructions. So these assemble really quick with no tool. Just remember which end you blackened. This will screw on. This is the end that I blackened. This is the end that you hold up to the light that I'm screwing on. And hopefully I did not measure, but hopefully I did not get this egg too small. Screw that in. Just drop this over it, which was a good fit. Thanks to that bit Tim gave me. Screw this end on. And that's it. <clears throat> now what I've done, got a little, this is a shelf liner. It's kind of sticky, rubbery, what you would put in your kitchen cabinets for set glasses on or whatever. I can use this. I found because I got one assembled the other day and couldn't get it loose. But that just gives you a little grip just to snug that up. And when I had the eggs too short, there was a little bit of a gap, so that tube slid back and forth. That's why I said I, I started making these a little bit longer. I don't know if this will work. Ah. You almost, almost. almost had it. Yeah, it's kind of, I'm looking at a, one monitor and trying to do it. There you go. You can see a little bit there in there go. anyway, out of fo focus, but basically, you can turn the other camera on there. You just hold it up to the light and rotate it, and that's your kaleidoscope. So, really a nice kit. Uh, like I said, they're about $10 each. And uh, that's all you do. So, anybody have any questions? All right. Anybody awake? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Been over. I just got back. <laughs> you did a good job, Phil. Thank you. Enjoyed that, Phil. Thanks. Yes. Very good. Thank you. I was going to do some polls, uh, but they didn't come out right. So I'll ask y'all. Uh, did y'all enjoy this bits and pieces? Yes, we did. We haven't gone two hours. We've only been an hour and a half. Yeah, this is very nice. Would y'all like to do more of these in the future? Certainly. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, a most important question, who wants to do the next demo? <laughs> <laughs> I've done two. We, we've had two live and beautiful you're downtown. Very good. You're very <laughs> good, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to follow that act. <laughs>